All right, once again, thank you for everyone for joining our live webinar today entitled Managing Fraud and Compliance Holistically, How a Unified Approach Delivers Incremental Benefits. Thanks for joining us for this timely topic and dynamic discussion. I'm your host, Stan Cowan with Effective. And joining me today are two experts with decades of experience in this industry and the topic that we're discussing today. David Matei, a strategic advisor with IITA Novarica Group, specializes in the payments industry, designing, building, and launching fraud and dispute systems. Prior to joining IITA Novarica, David was vice president and senior leader of product management for WorldPay, leading a team responsible for 1,400 financial institutions, more than 1 million merchants, and 40 billion transactions annually. Also with us today, we have Ravi Sandapudi, CEO and co-founder of Effective, a fraud and risk management platform designed to fight financial crime and help financial institutions stay compliant in a multi-channel environment. Before starting Effective, Ravi was the director of product development at PayPal, leading their efforts in building cutting edge fraud protection services for thousands of merchants, launching PayPal in China and developing their privacy infrastructure. Prior to PayPal, Ravi was Similitys' first employee, pioneering their fraud detection software. And before that, Ravi was on Google's risk, trust, and safety system team. Just a couple of housekeeping items to mention before we get started. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the live webinar. And we will leave time at the end to answer as many as we can. So please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button as we go along. Again, thanks for joining us today. And to get us started, I'll turn it over to David with ITA. David? Dan, thank you very much. I appreciate that. If you're not familiar with ITA Novarker Group, we are an industry research and advisory firm specializing in financial services, uh, but also have other uh, customers in the insurance and the payment processing, processing and investments area. And so we do and conduct primary research and, can, and write research reports and do consulting for our clients as well. Ravi. You get a little introduction about okay. effective. Thanks, thanks, David. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, as Dan mentioned, we are uh, an end to end fraud and compliance automation platform. Uh, we work uh, specifically with mid sized financial institutions like credit unions, community banks, lending companies, and fintechs. Um, and our platform helps, helps these organizations automate fraud detection, compliance. Uh, uh, and and money laundering detection and other other kinds of risks, uh, automating uh, identifying these risks within the organization. So very very happy to to be part of this uh, discussion today. Thanks. Wonderful. David. Forward to you. Appreciate it, Ravi. Thank you very much. So this is kind of a little background for our discussion going on today. Over the past couple of years, what we have noticed is that fraud has really changed quite dramatically. And there's a couple of different macro and environmental things that have happened uh, that has been a result of that. First of all being is that we are really now living in a digital world where most of the business is conducted online. Take a look at the chart in the upper right hand side of the screen today. And this is information from the US Census Bureau that shows the percentage of all US ret uh, consumer retail purchases that are done via e-commerce. And prior to the pandemic, what we saw is a very slow, steady, incremental rise quarter over quarter. Uh, and so right before the pandemic, it was about 10 to 10 and a half percent of all U.S. Uh, consumer retail purchases were being done online. That big spike that you see there, of course, that was second quarter of 2020 when lockdown went into effect. And then all of a sudden, everybody was trying to figure out how to buy something and when they couldn't go to a physical store. And since then, we've seen this leveling off. And right now we're about at 14, maybe 14 and a half percent of all US consumer retail spend is being done online. What the, if we had taken a look at the trend line from before the pandemic, it would have taken us another nine years to actually reach 14, 14 and a half percent of uh, congressmen. And so that was pretty dramatic increase associated with that. The other big thing that happened is that when the pandemic hit, well, unfortunately, you couldn't go to a bank or credit union branch any longer in order to be able to conduct business. And so you had to find other ways of doing that. So we did a survey of consumers. This was post pandemic. And we we're asking them about new services that they were introduced to and tried during the pandemic 
you know, which of those banking services were they likely to continue to do even in a post-pandemic world, even when the branches were back open again? And look at number two and number three on that list there. Mobile banking and online banking tied for second in place in this particular list. And so people are now using digital banking more often than we ever did in the past. So big, huge movement online with both e-commerce spend and also digital banking. The second thing really that's really big out there is the fact that there are a lot of personally identifiable information or PII data that has been breached over the years. And fraudsters are sitting on a lot of information about you and I. And so what has happened is that because of that, fraud has really changed over the past two to three years. What we see now is a proliferation in application fraud, people going online to apply for a new credit card uh, for a car loan, things along those lines. Account takeover is horrendous. Uh, you take a look at the amount of people who use the same password from website to website. And with all the PII data breaches that are going out there, pretty easy to go off and uh, take a take a uh, username password that's been breached and then being able to use automated technology like bots in order to be able to see which ones are still valid. And if they if you get a good hit, good chances are you'll be able to get to an either e-commerce site or an online uh, banking site as well. Synthetic identities, these are identities that are created out of the ether. They don't tie to any person. And so they're very hard to detect because if you go to a credit bureau or try to manage that or try to see if this exists, some of the data may look right, but not all of it. And so a lot of times uh, banks as well as e-commerce companies will allow these synthetic identity accounts to be created and the fraudsters will sit on them and then hit them hard later on. New activity, scams, and you know, other things that are happening. Uh, these are all quite popular, and we've seen a big increases and in shifts over the past couple of years in this area. So in, in a more traditional row, what we saw and found is that mitigating risk has become really difficult to go off and uh, manage anymore. Uh, in, in, in the older world, I would say, older world being just you know, even a few years ago, compliance had their mandate. Their job was to go out there and protect the FIs uh, to make sure that they stayed out of any kind of regulatory trouble, uh, whether it be at the federal level or at the state level. And basically, the compliance mandate was keep my financial institution out of the front page of the newspaper. The fraud mandate, their job was to minimize losses. Uh, it didn't matter whether it was the consumer's losses or maybe the, the FI's losses, but that's when that's what they were trying to do. So very focused, very specific, different silos, each with their own function. But what we have found here lately is that fraud and compliance have really become more blurred. Going back to the example that I mentioned before about synthetic identity. So this is, doesn't relate to any one particular individual. Uh, and then what happens is that the account gets groomed over time to the point where you had a bust out fraud. And so, you know, you may be able to open up a credit card, it's got a thousand dollar line of credit, and then over time, it'll up, it'll up to 5,000 or 10,000, whatever, you max it out, you run away, and you know, the FI will never see the money again on that. So the question is, is whose job was it to stop that? Should fraud have stopped that because there was a financial loss of whatever the credit limit was on the card? Or was it compliance's job to go off and stop that? Because, you know, uh, if it's a synthetic identity, then you can say, well, compliance didn't have a good KYC or know your customer process in place. The lines get blurred. Money laundering is another good example of that. So you got some suspicious activity. So the folks in the AML team will go through and investigate the suspicious transaction. And at the end of the day, they said, no, you know, there, there's nothing from an AML standpoint that's going on here, but it could be fraudulent though. What do the compliance folks do? Do they just ignore it and write it off and say, we're done? Do they notify anybody in the fraud department for them to go off and check on it? It, it, it? There's no real necessarily set policy in place all the time associated with this. Uh, the other scenario is you got that newspaper article where there is a mention in there about a FI being subject to a regulatory fine because there's some sort of money mule account and it's being used by organized crime in order to be able to launder money. So the question is, okay, well, whose job is that, compliance or fraud? Well, why did the money get transferred out if it's, you know, they didn't know who it belonged to or where it was going? 
well, why did the account get created in the first place that you could actually do the money mule? So, you know, what we're finding is that fraud and compliance really have a lot more in common today than they really ever have in the past. So what we're finding is that there's this convergence. Uh, the alignment that we find now between fraud and compliance are really coming together. They're not separate and distinct like they used to be in the, in the past. But the reason why some of this convergence is happening is that just out sheer necessity. Take a look at the budgets. You know, fraud and compliance both have limited budgets to go off and work with. And by pooling those resources together, you can get more bang for the buck. You can get more tools at your disposal than trying to go it alone. Uh, IT resources uh, across any company, mainly finance institutions, are really tight these days. And so if you have multiple or redundant tools to go off and deploy, one for fraud, one for compliance, it's wasted efforts uh, because you become much more efficient if you did something else. Uh, control frameworks that are fragmented, okay, compliance has got their stuff, fraud's got their stuff. Well, you got those situations that I just went through where you can have fraud falling through the cracks. And, you know, who's to blame? There's a lot of finger pointing going on at that point in time. Cross-channel fraud is huge. I can go through one channel and get uh, denied. I go to another channel and get approved, but it's all fraud. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good scenario. And then, you know, the common tools are coming into play right here. Machine learning, really popular these days, really effective at being able to find some of these really odd kind of situations out there. Case management tools, you know, sometimes it doesn't really matter is it a, it's a fraud issue or a compliance issue. It's something that needs to be tracked. And so case management can be applied across both of them. So the commonality of the tools between these two functions is bringing these groups together. And then again, you know, the opportunity loss. You know, if you got data sitting in different silos, uh, one doesn't know about the other set of information, you're, you're lost. So this brings us to our first polling question, and I'm going to turn it back over to Stan for this. All right. Hopefully the polling question is being displayed. Please take a moment to answer the following question. How are fraud and compliance BSA AML programs run at your organization? You can see the five choices there. We have a separate fraud and compliance department with limited to no collaboration. We have separate fraud and compliance departments with, no, with good collaboration. We're in discussion about combining fraud and compliance functions. Number four, we are in the process of combining fraud and compliance functions. And number five, we have combined fraud and compliance into one team. I see about a third of us have answered that so far. I give a few more seconds for people to answer, please. Please choose one of the five. Once we get some more, I'll end the poll and then we can share the results. I'm still seeing a few more being answered. We'll wrap it up here in a few seconds. All right. As you can hopefully see, the one that really garnered most of the results is number five. We've combined fraud and compliance into one department. But secondly, right behind it is number two. We have separate fraud and compliance departments with good collaboration. And then just a tad bit on number one. David, Raleigh, what do you think about those results? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, in, in, a, in a couple slides, I have some information to share with you all, but it's kind of consistent what we're hearing from some of the FIs that we're talking to. Ravi, what about you? Yeah, the same. I think a lot of the FIs are, like you mentioned, David, are, are on path of merging the two or uh, like are figuring out, right? But I think as we discuss further today, uh, there are multiple things that we could we could offer there from a tooling perspective. I think that that's all. So yeah, very yeah. interesting. It is, absolutely. Great. Before we get started, uh, restart, I should say, David, I just want to remind everyone, please click that Q&A button if you have questions along the way, and we'll be happy to answer those at the end. David, go ahead. Thanks, Dan. So what we find associated with convergence is that there's been this rise in what we call enterprise risk management systems that are coming to market. And it's combining both the fraud and compliance tools that are needed into a single solution. So no longer do you need to have separate tools for each group. Uh, you can bring them all together. 
but as nice as that, it's able to actually bring together discrete solutions and put it all within a unified package, a software program from one vendor. Uh, and being able to minimize the number of companies that you work with, the vendors you work with, certainly simplifies life for a lot of it, uh, groups within a FI. The centralization of data is really important because with that broader view that you have of what's going on with your customers, it's really more of a holistic view of the activity that allows you to be able to get insights that you would not have otherwise. And from a risk standpoint, it's a great way to go off and be able to mitigate it. So we did a survey of 19 of the largest F or the very large, I should say, FIs here in the United States about what are they doing related to compliance, fraud, and anti-money laundering. And you can see here, and this is very similar to the poll results that we just saw before, you know, 42% of these FIs said that they're bringing together the organizations uh, into one single management structure. Or 37% said, you know what, we got cross-functional groups that have been formed to be able to look at this holistically. So kind of in between, you know, having it both uh, separate as well as coming together. Uh, you can see from a tool standpoint, you know, they've combined case management and are doing information sharing uh, between the groups in order to be able to facilitate uh, analysis and, and some of the others there. So. The other thing that's interesting is the dark blue bars are those FIs who said who they've already done those, whereas the next shade of the blue bars indicate that those are uh, likely to go off and do it. And so you can have anywhere from you know 60 to 80 percent of the FIs that we interviewed are starting on or have embarked upon this journey. And there are a lot of reasons why FIs are doing this. Uh, just take a look at the optimization that you get from a workflow and process standpoint. Uh, agility is probably one of the biggest issues uh, because when fraud trends happen, they typically happen fast and furious. Uh, the ability to be able to go back and actually mitigate that quickly is extremely important. Uh, a cost, you know, we're all underneath cost pressures. There's no doubt about that. You know, we're trying to figure out how to get the uh, cost equation lower so that the profitability goes up for uh, the company. And so by combining this and going to an enterprise approach, you know, you got vendor fees, IT costs, uh, procurement costs, uh, all the efforts associated with that actually goes down. But one of the real big benefit is that you get closer to a 360 degree view. This is kind of the uh, the holy grail. You know, many of many of us want to be able to have that 360 degree view. Uh, you're not going to get there necessarily overnight, but if you can get to, you know, 240 or 270 <laughs> or even 300. Uh, to review, it's a lot better than nothing at all. And then the last thing is, is that uh, the consumer experience, much better consumer experience by going through this enterprise approach because it results in lower friction, uh, less use of multi-factor authentication and lower pos false positives. And the reason why consumer experience is so important is because one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, well, sounds great, but how do I go off and pay for it? We interviewed FIs and said, what impact does consumer experience play in being able to fund any kind of the initiatives or priorities that you have? And 65% of the FIs that we talked to said that client experience, if you have a way of often improving it, that can be very significant in terms of being able to get your next project approved and getting through the business case approval process. And so, uh, consumer experience is really good. So I would say reach out to your business partners because the people who are in the line of business, those are the ones who are typically will join you at the table to say, absolutely, this is a great project to go off and uh, get uh, to, to fund and to go off and support because of the multiple benefits that it can, prize, that it can provide across the entire organization. And that brings us to polling question number two. Back to you, Stan. All right, as you can see, the question here for you guys to consider and answer is, when considering your fraud and compliance control frameworks, which of the following would you most like to upgrade? Number one is KYC, KYB. Number two is AML. Number three is first party fraud prevention. Number four, third party fraud prevention. And number five, transaction fraud prevention. Please take a moment to answer. David, Stan, I mean, in case 
folks uh, need a refresher on what what these mean. Um, first party fraud is someone uh, acting as themselves, but with an intention to defraud the financial institution at some point. Right? Third party fraud is someone else pretending to be you using your credentials to to apply for a loan or basically stealing your your identity. Yeah, good point. Yeah. There's a lot of names being used out there in the industry for this kind of stuff. So uh, I've seen first party fraud by go by probably a dozen different names out there. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and share the results here. As you can see, looks like third party fraud has won the day mm -hmm. with first party and transaction fraud tying for number two. Ravi, um, as you can see, third party fraud is the highest concern there. Mm -hmm. Why why do you think this is a popular area with this audience? And do you think it's due to more attacks in this area? Or is it an area that's not really received much funding over the past few years? Yeah, I, th I think both. Um, but like David mentioned, the heavy digitization that's happening, right? it just opens up the avenue for someone stealing your credentials and, and impersonating you, right? So that's I think that's the result of what has happened during the lockdown. And now obviously no one wants to go back to offline channels anymore. Um, so this is, uh, I think it's it's on top of mind of everyone nowadays, so very relevant. Great, thanks for uh, answering that and explaining it better, Ravi. We're moving into our fireside chat with Ravi and David. Ravi just answered a question, so I will go ahead and go to you next, David, if you don't mind. Sure. So, David, organizations are sitting on more data than ever before. Yep. Yet, in many instances, that data resides in multiple application databases and lacks centralization. Why is there more interest in harnessing that power of collective data within financial services? Well, you know, there's kind of an old adage that says, you know, first time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. It's like, you know, most FIs have the data to be able to mitigate fraud. Uh, but the problem is, is that it's tied into different repositories, typically different tools from different vendors or maybe even some homegrown applications. And when you have that data separated like that, you don't know what's going on. So right. what we're finding is from the FIs that we speak with is that by bringing the data together, you can really do a much better job of being able to mitigate fraud. There was one uh, top 10 bank that I was speaking with last fall, and they had gone through the process of getting the 360 degree view of their customers. And the biggest issue they had was they would have a consumer, all right, John, sorry, they would have a fraudster who would go to one of the channels and they would get denied. And they thought there was great that they were being able to actually catch the fraudster there. The problem was, is that that fraudster would go to a different channel and get approved. And the second channel didn't know the fact that there was just an attempt through the first channel to try to go off and perpetrate and commit the crime there. And so again, great example of you got the data, but you're not leveraging it in order to be able to stop fraud. And the second reason is because take a look at machine learning models. Uh, machine learning has really grown in popularity and adoption over the past couple of years. And what does machine learning do? It really harnesses the power of data. But to be able to harness that power, you got to bring the data together in the first place. So there's a lot of initiatives going on within financial institutions to bring that data into a centralized area, or at least being able to have access to it for building some of these machine learning models and being able to leverage it and deploy it. Yeah, yeah just to add on to David, um, uh, I, I think you gave a great example. Another one that, that we've come across very frequently um, is someone opening up an account uh, opening a couple of accounts and then taking a check, depositing the same check in both the accounts at 4 p.m. And before it's clear, I mean, the balance gets updated with the, with the money, right? And at 4.55, they go to an ATM, draw the cash from both the accounts and then disappear, right? Like before, uh, before the bank is able to look at this pattern and to actually adjudicate the check, they have taken the money and disappeared. So I think this is something that's so easily solved. Like when, when you look at it, 
from from a broader perspective, it's such a clear pattern of fraud, right? Some why would someone open an account, deposit check, and withdraw cash within an hour? Right? So, but yeah. if you have the disparate systems looking at each of them, all of them look pretty benign, right? Like someone's depositing a check, someone's withdrawing money, but but yeah, unless you look at all of them together, it's uh, you'll you'll miss these patterns. And it's four p.m. on a Friday afternoon. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great, guys. Thanks for that one. And Robbie, we're going to move on to you now to answer this one first. With the high growth in digital banking, both online and mobile, more new accounts are being opened online than in person. How do you see FIs managing that online account opening process across the fraud and compliance functions? It's one process for the consumer. So what interactions do fraud and compliance have in defining a streamlined process for those consumers? Yeah, it's. I think um, if if you are opening up a digital channel to open accounts, the worst thing that you could do is now make it offline. Right? Like wait another day for someone to print the documents out, call you to submit like ID verification documents, and then follow up everything manually after that. Right. So uh, if if you are making the effort to open up. Uh, a digital account opening or a digital loan application uh, platform, then I think it's on us to to automate the rest of the uh, workflow behind the scenes, right? I think uh, there's now, like David mentioned, a lot of technology that's available, especially on the machine learning side and the data aggregation side, where you can really automate uh, the compliance checks and the fraud checks uh, in one single go, right? In real time, you can do all of this together. And the best part is if you look at compliance and risk and fraud risk together, you can create very high efficiencies. Again, like what David mentioned. So for example, when you have a digital channel where uh, someone's applying for an account, you could, uh, you could have fraud checks that are evaluating it for a bot. Right? So if it's a bot that's filling up the application, there's no reason to do a KYC, right? So you could, once you've detected it's a bot, you could as well just decline the application right away. So one, you are able to decide so much faster. Two, you're say high efficiency, right? You're not creating a queue for your compliance folks to go evaluate uh, definitely fraud, fraud fraudulent application. Three, you're saving a lot of costs, right? KYC checks are pretty expensive, even from a data perspective and from manual time. So you can, when you have this, when you're using these platforms and technologies behind the scenes to combine both of these uh, evaluations, like compliance and fraud, you can you can gain tremendous efficiencies and, and speed. And I think that's the, that's the right way to go. Even if it's a branch application, right? You're going to save, and you're able to adjudicate within a couple of seconds. Why do you want to still still follow a manual process? And, and you got to be real time with these decisions because right. when when financial institutions look for you know the litmus test or the benchmark of you know you know what's the gold standard, you do not look among other financial institutions for that. There are so many mm -hmm. other industries that do online digital very well that becomes the standard that people expect, especially young yeah. consumers. And so when, when you're able to get immediate decisions or decisions within a couple seconds, uh, when you're uh, applying for your new Netflix account or your Amazon right. Prime account exactly. or something along those lines, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to wait for a day or two or three to get a new account opened up online at your finance institution. You need to be immediate with that. Uh, and, and the other thing that we find is that uh, it's a little bit of a different process within a financial institution, but we see the line of business really kind of being the conductor of the orchestra, if you will, bringing together the fraud folks, the compliance folks, the credit risk folks, and whoever else you may need to, and saying, okay, you know, how do we do this? And coming up with one streamlined process that meets everybody's objectives and goals, uh, but doing it in a way that's fast and efficient. No, that's a great point, uh, David. You brought up, I think, credit risk as well, which is something that we are seeing on the effective side quite a bit. 
especially the new age fintechs. I think uh, this is something that the banks and credit unions could also have a look at is they're combining not just compliance and fraud risk, but also credit risk, right? So they're running even underwriting in that one single flow and they get to create pretty unique user experiences where if they've observed a little bit of a fraud risk, right? Maybe the email that was used to apply for the loan or the credit card was new, right? They haven't, there's no history behind that email address. It's a bit of fraud risk, but doesn't, doesn't uh, mandate a decline of the application, right? If you have different teams looking at underwriting and fraud, the fraud team would be extra careful to decline the application and saying, hey, I'm not going to pass this along. But now because they're doing all of this together, they're using that, that little bit of fraud risk score that they've computed to impact the APR rate of the card that was issued, right? So they're, yeah. they're doing really um, uh, like risk-based pricing. So they're still issuing a card. So, so the user is super happy, right? Everyone gets a credit card, but they have slightly different interest rates, right? Yeah. So the overall, the financial institution is still kind of maintaining this the risk portfolio, but but tremendous user experience. Or you know the the high risk uh, applicant may get a lower credit limit on their card, yeah, exactly, and yeah. a you know, better quality, better risk uh, profile right. user may get a higher limit on their credit card. But exactly. yeah, it's all dynamic because it's all yep. being done in real time. Yeah, awesome, great discussion, guys. David, your first step on our next question. Financial service firms are always looking to minimize financial losses from fraud, of course. Many of the tools that are selected are designed for that purpose. So what role is reputational risk having with FIs and decisions around their control frameworks? Reputational risk is becoming a bigger and bigger issue all the time. No doubt about it. Um, uh, we were interviewing FIs last year and one of the big issues that they were running into was the whole, unfortunately the war in Ukraine. And now you have sanctions lists and you don't want to be doing business with any kind of entity that happens to be on a sanctions list uh, uh, in, in the world. And so from a reputation standpoint, yes, you got to be making sure that uh, you are very careful about that. And unfortunately, sanctions lists are dynamic. You know, they're not static. They're, they're not just kind of fixed at one point in time. Uh, and so you can imagine come last February, March timeframe, uh, those things were being updated with uh, all kinds of new entities on it that banks had to be careful of uh, to be able to go off and do that. Uh, I would say money mules is another area where we're seeing a big uh, issue associated with reputational risk. Now, uh, when, when you have a money mule account, it's the, what a fraudster uses to basically get the money from that they initially obtained and then move it through multiple hops, typically through different financial institutions, into finally an account that they control. And the more hops, the more different F, uh, financial institutions that money flows through, the harder it becomes to go off and try to detect and have to claw back that money as well. But the problem with money mules is that they're very commonly used by organized crime, human traffickers, uh, things on those, those kind of you know, unsavory kind of people. And you don't want to be associated with or as to be defined as the bank that organized crime and human traffickers go to because your controls are lax and it's easy right. to go off and do it. And then the other thing that we found is, you know, we talked a little bit about it before the beginning, but synthetic identities. Uh, there was a fraud executive who just recently switched jobs. He went from one bank to another bank. And when he got to his new employer, one of the first things that he wanted to do was try to get a sense of how many synthetic identities do I already have on the books here at the new FI? And through the analysis that, that he did, he found that upwards of 12% of all existing accounts were associated with a synthetic identity. And that's a ticking time bomb because when the fraudster is hit, it typically results in rather large financial losses. Uh, but again, you know, it's also a, a reputation issue as well that uh, you know, can have serious financial harm on the financial institution, which then becomes front page news, which you don't want. Right, yeah, and exactly. Um... The, like what David mentioned, um, these synthetic identities also often end up being used as mule accounts, right? So money laundering and fraud is a very, very closely related problem. 
and uh, and if you start using like fraud risk related signals and and methodologies at the time of money laundering checks uh, again it cannot just happen once right because the sanction list that you have at the time of account opening is at that point in time right and the list change dynamically so if you combine those lists with other fraud fraud models and other fraud detection techniques you are able to actually expand on identifying some of these bad actors it's so so yeah I mean, it's uh, it's something that banks or, and other financial institutions have to be very careful all right thanks for that guys ravi coming back to you there are many opportunities for fraud and compliance departments to collaborate mm -hmm. as the it and Ovarica study shows roughly one third of fis are consolidated parts are consolidating parts of those two areas what are you seeing from effective clients are they making large-scale changes all at once or are they taking a more phased approach over time yeah, great question. I think um, it's always hard to rip and replace uh, for sure. So I think uh, phased approaches are always the right, right, right way to take this. And the best part is newer technologies, newer software systems like Effective and 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 our peers are very modular, right? So we don't need to uh, be enabled at the same time everywhere. So. Usually systems like these, you can plug in certain checkpoints at the beginning and then slowly add on data and the, and the system dynamically ingests additional data points and starts getting better, right? And the best part is the more that you add, the better every other uh, evaluation gets, right? Like for example, uh, if you started off only at the digital account opening time, right? um obviously you'll get get a lot of advantage from from a real-time evaluation and all that kind of stuff but then you enable for zero transactions right so now both those uh, checkpoints get better right so because this ed, by evaluating zero transactions the system is able to know what has happened at account opening time if there was a little bit of risk that was observed, use that risk to adjudicate Zelle transactions. And at the same time, you know from where Zelle transactions are happening. So you have those heuristics and distributions to adjudicate account openings uh, at a later point, right? So, so it's, it's a nice um, synergetic impact that, uh, that uh, financial institutions see, especially with uh, when combining and having a unified approach to uh, to uh, fraud evaluation, fraud and compliance evaluation, right? And what David mentioned, right? That three sixty degree view uh, is is uh, fairly game changing. Yeah, sometimes, well, not sometimes. Most institutions do not like to do the rip and replace projects because they're mm. big risk, they're big IT efforts. And so the, if you can go the, you know, slow, low and slow approach and, uh, you know, it's just, you know, you can maybe do a couple things year one, another couple things year two, et cetera, and put it in over time. It really does minimize overall risk for the IT project itself to go off and do it. And, uh, you know, you get the incremental benefits over time. You know, it really depends on the FI, how fast they want to throttle it. But, uh, you know, the, the low and slow with, you know, a modular approach, as Ravi talked about, typically is the best and most uh, uh, risk-free area that you can go in terms of a project along those skylines. Great. Ravi, coming back to you for our next one. It's, it's hard not to read something in industry magazines that doesn't mention customer experience these days. So yeah. how, much, how much does customer experience come up in conversations you have with both prospective and existing clients? as a goal in fraud compliance convergence? Yeah, um, it's it's very interesting. Um, uh, just as a background, uh, we used to have uh, another fraud detection uh, software company that, that got acquired by PayPal and so on a few years ago. Um, customer experience was never part of the conversation at that point, but it is changing, right? I think with all the... Um, uh, emergence of neo banks, all the fintechs that play that pay very very close attention to user experience, that has changed the game for the financial industry, right? And now 
uh, other traditional FIs like banks, credit unions, lenders are also paying very close attention to it. And like David mentioned, when Amazon and Netflix gives you an account in a couple of seconds, why why should someone wait for a bunch of days with a, with an FI, right? Uh, so it, it's coming up very frequently. And uh, I think having, again, some of these newer technologies available at your disposal where you can create a very custom uh, risk adjudication flows for your users can, can be game changing, right? So for example, if uh, you if you evaluate certain kinds of risks, for example, it's coming like the application was made from a reputed IP address using a phone number that you've already seen in the past, using a reputed email address and so on, you could, why do you want to add additional friction to those users, right? So you can, you can move them through a happy, quote unquote, happy path where they have a really, really good experience, their account is open instantly and so on. Whereas for folks where you observe risk, then you can add step up verifications, right? Only when it's truly necessary. One, obviously improves the user experience a lot. Uh, and two, it saves costs, right? Why do, you want to, why do you want to do all those checks every time um, for all your users? Do it only when truly necessary. And some of these things we are seeing with P2P transactions, right? A lot of banks uh, and credit unions uh, are trying to solve the Zell fraud issue by just reducing the cap on the amount of money that can be transferred via Zell transaction, right? But that really uh, worsens the user experience. Right? So rather, you if you have a dynamic system that's able to evaluate the risk of a transaction in real time, then you don't need to set these artificial limits uh, for for your users and your for your members, right? So, so I think uh, it is it is coming into the conversation. We have like uh, chief customer experience officers now sitting <laughs> on our on our calls, uh, which, like I said, never happened five to six years ago uh, with our previous company. Yeah, and I would say that e-commerce merchants and fintechs have really put the light on the art yeah. of the possible. And you know, financial institutions are not necessarily known as being tech savvy, especially from a customer standpoint. You know, banks come from a legacy of you know, get a piece of paper, print it out, come into the branch, and do it there. And and so it's been a bit of a uh, a wake up call really for finan traditional financial institutions, you know, the banks and credit unions out there, uh, because again, it comes back to expectations and when consumers have higher expectations, uh, then the traditional banks and credit unions really need to start focusing on consumer experience because, you know, that's really what's going to maintain their relationships that they have with those clients. And you may have already addressed this, but a follow-up question to that is, do, do you see these conversations happening more to fraud people in groups or compliance groups or roughly the same? I think you may have mentioned that you're seeing more of one now than in the previous, but if you could just explain that a little bit further. Yeah, I would say a yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> because when it comes down to consumer experience, especially from an uh, online banking, digital banking perspective, uh, I'm seeing multiple people come to the table. Uh, it's not just fraud or compliance. It's people typically from the line of business. Uh, it's people from the IT area, from the risk, the credit risk area. They all are now at the table talking about one: what does the flow look like? You know, how do we streamline it? You know, rather than asking for the same information twice one for the compliance folks, one for the credit risk folks how do we do it once and then share that information internally? The line of business folks are all going to be about consumer experience, forget about fraud. And the fraud folks are saying, hold on one second, time out. <laughs> and so there's this very healthy dialogue that happens when you get everybody to the table and talking about it. And when you get different perspectives like that, then I believe that you get a better overall process designed that's optimized for the end user. Uh, such that the user experience is something that they're going to be very comfortable with. Uh, but it does take everyone coming to the table because 
you know, you got to make that streamlined. You got to make it efficient for the user. Uh, you don't want it to re-enter multiple pieces of data, and you know, in, in the day of doing more with less, you know, what is the minimum set of data that I need in order to be able to affect the creation of a new online account uh, for a new customer coming to you know my bank or my credit union, and so. Uh, it really kind of takes that cross-team collaboration uh, in order to be able to do it well. All right. Well, if there's no more thoughts on those questions, feel free to jump in if you have them. But it's time now, I think, to move to our audience questions. We do have a few that have come in. Just a reminder, please click that Q&A button if you'd like to submit even more. We have some time here to talk about them, it looks like. So the first question I'll pose uh, from our audience out there is, is there a way to link financial and non-financial events to have a more complete 360 degree view? Ravi, would you like to start with that one? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, actually, uh, that is something that um, can, can make a huge difference, right? So by non-financial events, these would be like login, Right, pin change, password change, adding a new beneficiary before a wire transfer is made. So, so these kind of events can add a lot of context uh, from a risk uh, evaluation perspective, right? So, like we discussed before, if someone changed their password, added a new, added a new beneficiary, and initiated a wire transfer within like fifteen minutes, right? Is that an expected user behavior pattern? If not, if it's an anomaly, are there other, other things that you can look for, right? Is, is it coming from an IP address uh, that's part of a Tor network, or is it a VPN, or is it a cloud IP, right? Does it belong to AWS or uh, Google Cloud, which is something that we are seeing uh, quite frequently right now? Um, uh, this this can be mitigated, right? So the more data points that you can plug into your risk system, it adds to that 360 degree view and makes all kinds of risk adjudications far, far better. Yeah, in a prior life, I used to manage credit card, debit card fraud systems. And so we would talk to it, talk about it in the terms that we call monetary transactions. That means the card's being used to make a purchase and you got to make a decision in terms of whether you approve or decline this uh, authorization request. So that'd be the monetary side of things. And then we decided, okay, well, we need to start looking at non-monetary transactions. And what we mean by non-monetary transaction is what's going happening at the account. So great example, uh, you would have the fraudster call into the call center get through all of their screening questions, you're authenticated now as a real user, and you said, okay, change my PIN. <laughs> okay. And then about uh, 10 seconds later, there is a cash withdrawal transactions at the ATM using that debit card for the maximum allowed for the day for that card. Okay, hold on. Things are a little bit odd here about that, but that's why you know you have to bring in data signals, risk fraud signals from all kinds of different areas. So that non-monetary data, so whether it be activity going on at the call center, call activity in the branch, activity online, so device ID, you know, and what are they doing online? Are they changing my shipping address? Are they changing my email address? Did they just change my phone number? And so, you know, phone number being intercepted for OTP message, email be, uh, address being changed for possible OTP or other purposes as well. All those are great fraud signals and you gotta be able to leverage all that information to make smart decisions and protect not only you, the FI, but also protect your clients as well. All right, thanks for answering that guys. Next one we have from our audience says, how do you reduce the number of false positives while still keeping a frictionless digital experience? Great question. <laughs> yeah, I think it comes down to feedback loops. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I mean by feedback loops is that, again, there's lots of activity going on inside of a financial institution across many different channels. And even, even after a decision gets made, sometimes that decision was right, which is hopefully most of the time, but sometimes invariably you're going to make a bad decision. And what you need to be able to do is that whenever there's a bad decision made, that is an opportunity to learn. 
And so there's got to be a mechanism by which you feed that information back into your fraud and compliance systems so that it can learn from those mistakes. And over the course of time, then you get better and smarter at making decisions. And the tools that you're using, again, are leveraging that kind of data as well. So don't hide those mistakes. Those mistakes are valuable uh, for both you, the finance institution, and for others as well. Uh, but leverage that data. Make sure you do the analysis on it. Why and how did that mistake get made? And then use that to go back in and retune or tweak your system appropriately in order to avoid those mistakes happening in the, in the future. Great. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head over to you, Robbie, for this next one. It actually has something to do with what you just said, David. It's pretty timely that you just answered it that way. How do machine learning capabilities help solve these challenges? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think what, what David mentioned, uh, all of those practices are very critical to, to machine learning systems, right? I think, uh, I mean, uh, in the end, machine learning uh, basically are like, they are glorified rule sets, right? Where, where the thresholds are being learned statistically rather than someone hard coding them by hand. And, um, I know I'm simplifying things with that data scientists in the audience. I know you'll be hating me, but uh, but <laughs> this is what I understand. Uh, 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 and uh, machine learning um, systems uh, really help again from from an efficiency, accuracy, from a false positive point of view, and things of that sort. Right. So when you have hard coded rules and thresholds, like I said, uh, putting a limit. You have a rule that says, hey, if a Venmo transaction is over uh, $200, reject, right? So, so that can result in a lot of false positives, obviously. Right? Uh, you are rejecting a lot of genuine transactions. And uh, whereas if you have a machine learning based system that's learning, looking at hundreds of data points to evaluate whether that Venmo transaction is actually uh, looking suspicious, then your false positive rates falls down, right? Like you're not just looking at the value of the transaction, but the time of day, the device that's being used, uh, what is the historical context for this particular user? Have they uh, made a uh, higher value transaction in the past? All this kind of stuff can flow into um, your machine learning models. And basically because it's, uh, it's the computer figuring out these rules, these rules can be very, very sophisticated, right? So instead of having just one criteria of the transaction value, you're looking at hundreds of criteria uh, and uh, taking a decision based on all of them. So, so yeah, uh, so I think machine learning is a perfect use case for, for fraud detection, right? So because you have examples and feedback loop, like David mentioned, either it's chargebacks or it's customer complaints, all of these can feed in and train train your models to, to perform as you as you would like to. And the other thing about it is, you know, Robbie, you mentioned that machine learning is kind of a glorified you know, rules engine, but uh, I'm yeah. sure the data scientists are kind of cringing right now. With that one. But, yeah. uh, the one thing you find about rules is that they apply the same policy to everybody. Yes. Right. And we're all different. And we all have different habits and different behaviors. And so what machine learning allows you to do is to get to the point where you are customizing the experience for each individual consumer that you have, which is hugely important. So, I mean, we had an example from my past where uh, fuel transactions, historically fuel transactions were notoriously bad as being high fraud. And so, you know, we had an institution who put in a static rule that said no more than one uh, gas fill up or two, two gas transactions in a day or maybe over the course of two days, because who needs to fill up more often than that? Well, that's good for the suburbanite who's sitting around home and not going very often or the person working from home these days. But guess what? The cross country track driver, driver, they're filling up a lot. And so it doesn't work for them. And 
but we need to get to the point where we treat everybody individually and uniquely and not as one big monolithic group because it doesn't apply that way. Machine learning allows you to customize and tailor it and deliver even a better consumer experience than what uh, hard and fast static rules do. Awesome. Let's see if we can squeeze in one more question from our audience. They're asking, how can we stay up to date and future proof our solutions with our efforts to prevent fraud with so many threats out there? Yeah, I would say that what's, what's really important there is that when you start looking for systems, you got rather than looking for a discrete tool that does just one thing, you got to have tools that are multifaceted, uh, that are able to do many different kinds of capabilities all at once. Because to the extent that you can go off and do that, you can deploy one particular feature today, and that may address a problem that you're having right now. But guess what? tomorrow, you know, next month, whenever, a new problem is going to crop up and you're going to need to be able to respond to it. If I have partnered with somebody, with a vendor who has a multifaceted solution and I need a new tool and I need to go off and deploy it quickly, then if I've already coded and integrated that particular vendor, then hopefully deploying that new tool is either a simple uh, IT change, or even better, maybe just a configuration change that can be done by someone in the business line or in the fraud group, uh, and or be able to, uh, to bring a new tool online almost instantaneously. And now I have another tool at my disposal and or be able to mitigate uh, the new form of fraud that I'm just beginning to experience right now. So what I, he what I see too many times is that uh, institutions will have many vendors, each doing one thing. And when you try to uh, respond to a new threat, you can't spend time going through an RFP, uh, vendor selection, testing, IT project to go off and deploy, and then you know finally have a tool at your disposal that you can use to protect yourself. By that time, you're gonna be out of business because the fraudsters are gonna hit you hard and heavy and the losses are gonna be too high. Yeah. So you really have to look at those tools that are multidimensional that can actually address many different problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fraud is multi-channel, right? So it's never, <laughs> never going to just hit you on one and, and yep. stop there. And the other things are, I, I think, um, there's a lot of research being done, and where, like, even at Effective and in, Invested, a lot is on consortiums, right? So especially like data private. This has been done on the credit side, right? There are bureaus that, that do it uh, from a credit worthiness perspective, uh, not yet very, like not truly invested in on the fraud side, right? But that's changing. Uh, as a lot of our partners on the, on the data service providers as well, uh, we are working on building out these consortiums, right? So can you, from a privacy centric way, encode observed fraud patterns from one financial institution and warn the others, right? Before it even hits them or update their rule sets or their models, even before that pattern has, has hit you. Something very similar that antiviruses, virus softwares do, right? So encoding uh, certain patterns of, of fraud and then trying to mitigate it early. So um, one is, having a multi-channel approach within your FI, that, that solves like 90, 95% of the problem. For the last 5%, um, I think looking at how you can share data uh, with your peers in a very privacy-centric way uh, can, can be that next evolution in this uh, space. Great, thanks guys. I know we're bumping up at the top of the hour here. Uh, David, I'll let you uh, say some final comments and we'll hand it over to Ravi and then I'll wrap it up. Yeah, yeah I appreciate the time and the opportunity to join Ravi and uh, Stan you today on this uh, really informative and interesting discussion. Uh, it, it's just the wave of the future. Uh, you you got to bring these groups together because the more collaboration you have, the more efficiency you're going to drive and that's what it's all about these days. So. Uh, uh, certainly look forward to all the people who are online today uh, watching this or who are going to be watching it down in the future. Uh, certainly take a look and see what you can do in order to continue to, to improve and those collaborations among all the different groups that you have inside your financial institution. 
And yeah, thank you, ANG and, and David, you specifically couldn't have had a better person to have this conversation with. Uh, so thanks a lot. And uh, and yeah, like uh, you mentioned before, um, we, are, we are in this domain, have been in this space for several decades now. Uh, we are out and out fraud and risk nerds. Uh, so if you ever want to chat anything uh, about fraud or compliance or credit risk, uh, please shoot us an email. Hello at effective.ai. I would we'd love to love to have a conversation with you. And, and fraud you. and compliance nerds are the best kind of nerds to have. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. That's great. All right, thank David, all. Ravi, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining and for your questions and participation in today's live webinar. If you do have additional interests, like Ravi said on the topic or have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to the email or go to the website as you can see on your screen there. And uh, we'd be happy to have you uh, connect with us today. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.